Grace, mercy, and peace are yours. From God our Father, through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. As I mentioned earlier, over the next few weeks, we're going to be looking at the Ten Commandments in detail. And even though we could never completely mine the incredible depths of each one of these commandments, it's my prayer for you that over the next few weeks you you grow in, in knowledge and understanding of just the, the richness of God's grace for you and love for you as we look at these commandments. And no one commandment expresses that truth more than the first and most sacred of God's commandments. You shall have no other gods. Today the, the Holy Spirit teaches us as we look at these words that there is no God like yours. I invite you to stand as we read these verses from Deuteronomy 5 in Jesus' name. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sins of the fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. We bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, these are your words we pray that you make us holy by the truth. Your word is true. Amen. Please be seated. So what is an idol? Well, the word idol just means a, a carved image that is improperly given false worship. And today, to begin with, I, I just want to look at two distinctions when it comes to that sin of idolatry. And the first distinction that's important for us to keep in mind is proper versus improper. You see, we're told in Scripture that everything God creates is good and therefore has its right and proper place. And yet, so often, when, when Christians might read these words about God saying there should be no images from anything, from heaven above, or earth below, or the sea beneath, in front of you for, for worship, they, they might look at something like having a cross in the front of your sanctuary and, and ask the question, well, how is that not an idol? And so the question is, it becomes, comes down to that important distinction between proper and and improper. If something is our hearts to the one true God, then it is serving its proper use and function, especially in, in worship. And we have examples of this in the Old Testament. Oftentimes when God commanded worship in the Old Testament, uh, for instance, with the Ark of the Covenant, with these two beautiful golden carved angels on top of it. He commissioned one of the greatest craftsmen of all the Israelites, that was to direct people's hearts to God. Later in the temple, by God's command, again, the, the temple was filled with beautiful carved images, all to point hearts to God. So whether it's a cross in front of us, a picture of Jesus, or another spiritual image, it's not idolatry as long as it's serving that purpose. But an image, even an image of a cross, can be misused. For instance, oftentimes I, I see people using crosses as like a good luck charm. You know, if, if I have this cross hanging from my rearview mirror, then that's going to be, that's going to protect me from evil and, and keep me from getting into accidents. Um, that's an improper use of a cross. It's not using the cross as the mercy seat of God, but a good luck charm. 
By the same token, uh, saints and angels can be properly given honor and respect. However, it is improper to, to pray to them or to ask them for intercession because that is the domain of God alone. So there's this difference between proper and improper. And the other difference I want to point out briefly is the difference between true and false worship. In order to get into that, we have to understand what worship is. Well, oftentimes when we hear the word worship, we think of you know, things like prayer and praise. And that's certainly part of worship, but that's a, that's a small part of it. You see, the human being was created for a perfect relationship with the triune God. And so worship isn't so much about what we give to God, but it's more about God coming to us. Worship is about having union and communion with the one true God through the forgiveness of sins, through, through things like hearing God's word, and through receiving his sacraments. So it's understanding that, that worship means God is coming to you and, and filling you, completing your soul with his personal presence. And it's precisely because we don't understand what worship is that we often fail to understand what idolatry is. Because idolatry is really the, the heart and soul of it is turning to something else to receive from that thing what we can only get from God. What we can only receive from God. And what's really interesting is that over the ages, the sin of idolatry really hasn't changed. Just like in the ancient world, there's, there's an image that we fall down and worship. That image will, will promise blessing in exchange for sacrifice. And that image promises the greater the sacrifice, the greater the blessing. You know, in the ancient world... If you wanted a good harvest, sacrifice a cow. If you want a great harvest, if you want great blessing, sacrifice your child. There is one difference, though, I would say, between now and the ancient world, is that instead of a carved image, per se, we have abstract images in our hearts. But they're still very real. And I just want to give you some examples of those. For instance, as a, as a pastor, it's very easy for me to make my ministry an idol. And even though outwardly it seems like I'm serving God, inwardly in my heart I'm really just making sacrifices to my own ego trying to advance my career, trying to be great in other people's eyes, trying to make the church grow and grow and grow so I get a bigger and, and better name and better reputation. That's a sin of idolatry. At the same time, we can keep in our hearts an image of parenthood. What, what does it mean to be the perfect parent? And we strive towards this, this image. And, and what we tell ourselves that, that we need is, is our child's love and adoration and, and friendship. And we're willing to sacrifice things in order to get those. We're willing to sacrifice maybe our relationship with our spouse. We're willing to sacrifice our time with God if it means making the kids happier. Other images we fall down and worship are images like beauty. You know, we've got this idea of this, this aesthetic of what a person ought to look like and, and what a beautiful person ought to be like. And if we don't measure up to that aesthetic, then, then I feel like I'm somehow flawed and, and defective. And so people make sacrifices to this God. You know, there's yoga, there's exercise, sacrificing fast food. We're getting rid of that. Some bow down to the porcelain god just to try to get their image again to look like it's supposed to. 
Sexuality is another idol that our culture puts in front of people. What's sad about this is our, our culture is so, so driven by sexuality today. It's constantly sending young people the message to define their identity based on who or even the gender that they're attracted to. Oftentimes, um, this, again, this idea of perfect sexuality is, is so much in front of us because of just the content we see and watch, advertisement, movies. That if, if what I have in a healthy Christian marriage doesn't measure up to that, then I feel like there's something missing from my life. And, and people often go out searching for that perfect sexual fulfillment. If they can't find it on the internet, they'll find it somewhere in someone else. The list of false gods can go on and on. We worship things like recreation. We worship the cabin dream, how much money we have to sacrifice to, to have that cabbage, cabin dream. We worship sports, athletics, health, wellness, safety even. What's really interesting is how the gods we fall down and worship today are very much similar to the pantheon of ancient gods people worshipped in the ancient world. Nothing has changed. We still fall down and worship beauty and sex and industry and prosperity. 1 Corinthians 10, 1 Corinthians 10 tells us an idol, that image, is nothing. But what's behind the idol is a demon. And they're full of fine promises. They'll promise us the world, but in the end, we'll, we'll never be satisfied. We'll never find what we're looking for. We just walk away empty and craving more and more. And all the while, we've sinned against God's most sacred commandment. God says, I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sins of their fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. And so there we are between those two positions. Do we, do we break God's commandments and bring his wrath and punishment upon us, or am I someone who keeps God's commandments and receives his love? And though I try day after day after day to keep my heart pure from the sin of idolatry, and we find again and again the harder I try, the more I sin. The more I fall into that sin. The more I find I don't measure up to that, those thousands of generations that love God and keep His commandments. That's not me. There's only one person who could love God perfectly and keep God's commandments. And that's Jesus. See, what's interesting is, throughout the Old Testament, God forbade the representation of him in an image. Uh, the Israelites had no image of God at all. And this is leading up to the point when Jesus would come to earth. Uh, we're, we're told that, that Jesus is the image of God, the firstborn over creation. Um, that's, that's the only one through whom we can really, truly find true worship. And he was made in the likeness of sinful flesh. He came just like you and I, was born of a virgin, so that he could take those two, God in his holiness and mankind in our fallen state, Bring us back into union and communion together by his perfect sacrifice on the cross. We're told in, in the book of Colossians chapter 1 that, that, God, that God reconciled all things, whether things in heaven or on earth, by making peace shed through Jesus' blood. Peace through Jesus' blood shed on the cross. See, the truth is, in order to believe a lie, there has to be a grain of truth to it. 
You know, the demons will promise us with idolatry that, uh, you know, sacrifice enough and I'll give you this blessing. And really both are lies. We can never sacrifice enough and they can't deliver the blessing that they promise. But there's truth to that lie. That through sacrifice, we receive blessing. God knew we could never sacrifice enough to receive his goodness, his blessing. So, so Jesus willingly paid the ultimate sacrifice. Again, the, the greater the sacrifice, the greater the blessing. And Jesus does exactly that. God willingly handed over his firstborn son to be laid down on the cross for us. Jesus willingly laid his life down in our place, died for us to give us God's blessing of eternal life. And how you know that you belong to that, the thousands who love God and keep his commandments isn't because I'm able to keep God's commandments, but because Jesus has kept God's commandments perfectly and Jesus makes you one of his descendants through baptism. Through God's gracious gift of baptism, you are one of the thousands of generations belonging to Jesus. And for Jesus' sake, God declares you not guilty. Your sins are forgiven. You are baptized into Christ. Therefore, you are freed from the guilt of your parents. And your children and their children's children are freed from the guilt of their parents through faith in Jesus Christ. Contrast between idols and God doesn't stop there. Idols say sacrifice first and then I'll give you a blessing just like that that con artist on the phone. <laughs> you won a million dollars. Just give me your social security card, your your uh, credit card information and uh, all of your bank account information, right? Sacrifice, then I'll give you the blessing. God says, no, I give you the blessing up front. Notice how he begins the commandments. I am the Lord who brought you out of Egypt. He's saying, I've already given you everything you need for free. Now just serve me in love. What does that service look like? Offering service to an idol, to a demon, sucks. It sucks the life out of us. It sucks the love out of us, our time, our energy. It demands 100% of everything we have given to that one thing. And everything else in our life withers and dies. But when we serve God, when we put God first, when we love God first, He enables me to love everyone else in my life more than I ever could without him. When we serve God with our time, but so often people worry about having enough time. It never seems like there's enough time. God is the God who created time. Put him first. Put time with him first. Put his worship first. Just see if he won't make everything else fit into place just the way it needs to. Even our trust in God. Trust God first. There's so many reasons to be afraid today. Worried about government. Worried about viruses. But you know what? Place your trust in God. He doesn't promise that bad things won't happen. But he promises he's going to work them for your good. A God who is able to work immeasurably more than you could ever ask or imagine through the power that is at work, at work within you. So when God says, you shall have no other gods, what he's doing is, is really inviting us to line up all the false gods that are, there are in our life and compare them to the one true God. And we can look at all that and say, there is no God like ours. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.